Our next speaker is Charles uh, Guillaume. Uh, he is the Chief Security Officer at Ledger, and he'll be talking about uh, open source hardware wallets. So please give a hand for Charles. Twix, yes. Hi, everybody. I am very happy to be uh, here today. Actually, uh, last year, I came to present the threat model for hardware wallet. And today, I'm going to present how the threat actually apply. My presentation is called Funds are Safe, and this is the security assessment of open source hardware wallets. First of all, a quick word about me. As you can hear, uh, I'm French. Um, my name is Charles Guillaume. I'm Chief Security Officer at Ledger. So basically, I'm in charge of the security of uh, Ledger's products. And as you can imagine, it's a pretty big topic. Um, my background is hardware security. I worked in hardware security for more than 10 years, designing a secure system and trying to uh, break them uh, as well. My background is cryptography and mathematics and, of course, hardware security. I joined Ledger a bit more than one year ago, and I created what is called uh, Ledger Donjon. Ledger Donjon is an, is an awesome uh, security team. And our mission is to, uh, to help the design team to, um, for our upcoming security products and also to improve the security of our existing products. What we do day to day is to continuously attack our products because we think the only way to uh, having a high security uh, solution is to try to break into. So we work to find vulnerabilities and then we report this vulnerability to uh, the design team and help them to uh, counteract our attack. Our fields of expertise are side channel attacks, perturbation attacks, software attacks, and of course, cryptography. As a global leader in the industry, we feel the responsibility to enhance the security of the whole ecosystem. We want to help individuals and uh, industries to secure their digital assets. To do so, we uh, share our attack method. We also share our uh, <clears throat> attack tools that you can find on, on GitHub. And recently, we spent some time to evaluate the security of open source hardware wallets. And this is the topic of my presentation. So <laughs> we limited our uh, study to SCA, like uh, side channel attacks, software copy attacks, um, supply chain attacks, and a surprise concluding attack. But first of all, I, I will do a very uh, brief introduction of open source hardware wallets. Um, the target of our evaluation is uh, Trezor. Uh, Trezor is the most popular open source hardware wallet, and it, uh, it's used as a basis for all the other uh, hardware, um, <coughs> open source hardware wallets. Uh, it's a fully open source project which implements a monolithic operating system and it acts as a security enclave. That means that the keys remain uh, inside the circuit and they never leave the circuit. Uh, I mean, we hope so. Um, it implements an immutable bootloader uh, in, which is in charge of checking the signature of the firmware which runs into. The main security function is uh, the uh, pin verification. That means that uh, if the user does not enter its pin, uh, he, he cannot do anything with uh, its funds. Uh, the, the cryptography is implemented uh, in software because they use a general purpose MCU, and this MCU does not embed a cryptography accelerator. So having a fully open source uh, project has definitely some benefits. The first one is uh, anyone can audit the code, so it's definitely a benefit. It's possible to uh, compile and load your own firmware. It's pretty cool as well. But there is also drawbacks. When you, you want to build a fully open source uh, solution, you have no choice uh, for the hardware you use. You cannot use secure hardware. You are forced to use Open, to, to use a general purpose MCU. General purpose MCU are pretty cool MCU uh, for many applications like your boiler, 
like your uh, TV remote controller, but they are not designed for security. They are designed for low power, they are designed for, for having a low cost circuit, but they are not designed for security. And also this, this kind of MCU can be bought on any electronic store, so it's difficult to uh, ensure the genuineness of uh, such devices. So first of all, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, genuineness because it's uh, an important topic. Um, <clears throat> supply chain attacks. So supply chain attacks consist for an attacker to try to modify, to alter, or to replace a device during uh, the supply chain. The supply chain starts from the design of the device, then the manufacturing up to uh, the shipping to the user. As a user, when I receive my tweezer, the question is, how can I be sure this tweezer is genuine? I'm doing uh, uh, some spoiler. The, the, the answer is, there is no way to be sure of that. Of that. Tweezer implemented two different measures to um, guarantee the genuineness of the, the device. The first one is to have a, a immutable bootloader. That means that this bootloader is supposed to uh, to be read-only, uh, but the problem is that this bootloader can be overwritten in software. They notice this, they try to patch it. Um, it's, patched, it's probably correctly patched on Twizzle. Uh, I don't know, the, they, they did some uh, MPU trickery, uh, but on other projects, it's not patched. But uh, in all cases, it's always possible to open the box, to take the circuit, erase it and reload the new bootloader and the new firmware, or even to unsolder the, the, the circuit and to sold ba solder back uh, another circuit. So the bootloader is not very immutable. The second um, security measure for uh, guarantee the genuineness is a, a security holographic seal. This is the, the small sticker on, on the box. Um, as you can see, we uh, play with this, uh, this uh, holographic security seal. And with, if you use some uh, hot hair and a scalpel, it's not very difficult to um, remove this security seal and then open the box, remove the genuine device, the black one, and <clears throat> replace this device by uh, a white, uh, white device. Um, for the sticker, it's also possible to uh, find manufacturer in China and to manufacture exact clone of the sticker, and it costs uh, around one dollar. Uh, Twizzle is aware of this because uh, there, there are some counterfeiting of their uh, product. So, what we did uh, for, for now is to uh, take a black device, put it in the uh, open, open the, the box, remove the black device, and uh, replace it by a white device. So it's, it's interesting, but it's not really an attack. But why does it matter? It, it does matter because in this white device, I could uh, insert some kind of backdoor. Um, you can backdoor the device in many different ways. The most obvious way is to uh, do preceding. Preceding, that means that you, you are the attacker, you put a seed inside the device, you modify the firmware, such as the user uh, thinks he is about to generate its own seed, but is not, and then uh, you, have, you, you already know his seed. There are many, many other different ways to uh, backdoor the device, um, <clears throat> but I won't uh, get into uh, all the de these details. Uh, one can argue, if I buy my device at Twizzle, I can be sure that uh, it, it will a genuine one. Actually, it's not completely the case because there, is, there are many different ways to uh, uh, get into supply chain and a very uh, common attack is the, follow -on, is the following. Uh, you buy a lot of devices from Twizzle, you take them, you backdoor them, and you send them back to the manufacturer asking for reimbursement uh, using your withdrawal period. And in this case, there is a lot of chance that this device uh, go uh, to uh, legit users. Um, I spent some time to implement a backdoor uh, uh, firmware, and as you can see, 
It's a brand new firmware. Would you connect it uh, for the first time uh, to your computer? This is the first screen. Then you go on Twizzle website, which requests you to uh, verify if, if the um, sticker is OK. Then you load the, the, the Twizzle firmware. You believe so. And then you will generate your own seed. But in this case, I already preceded the device, and the seed is security issue, security issue, security issue. So I can offer a device, but I already know the seed. So this was the first item. Uh, we responsibly disclosed this uh, problem to Twizzle, and they, in November, I guess, and they uh, said us that it's uh, out of the scope. So it's quite unfortunate. We were a bit disappointed, but this is their product at the end. Um, the second item is uh, the soft software crappy attacks for the SCA um, th theme. So this is a hardware device, but on the, this hardware, there is some, some software which uh, runs on top of it. And uh, this, this software, as, as, soon as, you, as soon as you write some software, there can be some vulnerabilities. So uh, we try to evaluate the security of uh, this software stack. This is the monolithic operating system. So the, the attack surface is quite smaller, but still, uh, this is uh, some software. So we implemented mostly fuzzing. We fuzzed uh, all the software interface, and we found uh, two vulnerabilities on this software stack. Uh, it was possible to overwrite the stack. Um, that could have been a problem, but uh, the, their, their stack is, um, there was a, st a stack protection, a stack cookie. So it, it would have been possible to brute force the stack cookie, but at the end, there was only a few bytes controlled by the attacker, maybe six or eight. So uh, I've, we think this, uh, this vulnerability were not exploitable. So it's a pretty good code base, because only two vulnerabilities uh, to, uh, with uh, such a code base, it's not that much. We reported it uh, to them, uh, there's two vulnerabilities, and they properly patched them very quickly, so uh, we were happy. The first item is a side channel attacks. This is my favorite rant. Um, side channel attacks consist in measuring the power consumption of a device or um, the electromagnetic emanation of the device during its computation, and to try to figure out if there is a correlation between this power consumption and the data which is uh, handled inside the device. And if there is such a correlation, there are many ways to exploit it. Um, this kind of attacks have been discovered during the 90s by Paul Kosher. Uh, at this time that was called DPA. And now this is a very wide class of attacks with a lot of different exploitation. I will uh, give two examples on Twizzle. Um, we study the verify pin function, which is the core uh, security function of Twizzle. Uh, it's a very simple function. When the user inputs his pin, the device will scan the digit one after the other and we'll compare this, this digit with the correct value of the pin. At the end, if all the digits are correct, it's, a, it's OK. If, if, it, if, it, if they're not, um, it's uh, not OK. So we measure the power consumption of the device during this pin comparison. This is our uh, awesome oscilloscope with uh, the device. Uh, you can see uh, electromagnetic probe and the power consumption probe. So we input a lot of different uh, pin to the device and measure the power consumption of the device uh, during this pin comparison. And then, regardless the value of the pin we uh, input, we try to figure out if there is a correlation between the traces and the correct value of the pin, which is stored inside the flash, because it's used during the comparison, of course. And the colored peak on the bottom um, uh, <clears throat> means that there is a such, such a correlation. Now I will um, explain quickly how this, this correlation can be exploited. Um, in computer vision, uh, there is a such hype around uh, deep learning. Uh, in deep learning, the idea is to 
Uh, for, for the image, the idea is to recognize uh, things on an image. If we take the example of uh, dogs and cats, the idea is to collect a large number of dogs and cats pictures, feed them to a machine learning algorithm, and train, train it. For each picture, we explicit that this very picture is a cat and the, uh, this picture is a dog. You do it with a large number of pictures and at the end, the machine learning algorithm is trained. And you take a picture, you request to the machine learning algorithm, is it a dog or is it a cat? And it will give you a, a probability for this very picture to be a dog or to be a cat. We can learn the pin the power consumption of the device for uh, the pin verification in a very similar way. You take a device A, you input a, a large number of different uh, pin value, correct pin value, and then you measure the power consumption of the device when um, it, this, the, this pin value is uh, used. So we train our machine learning algorithm on a device A with a large number of traces, and then on a device B, we measure the power consumption of the device during the pin comparison, and we request to the machine learning algorithm what is the correct value of the pin, and it will give, give us the most likely value uh, for each digit. So putting all the things together, we get a device A, we record many traces with random value of pin, then we train our machine learning algorithm to learn the behavior of the device during this pin comparison, uh, as a function of the correct value of the pin. And then the second phase is the attack phase. The attacker gets a physic physical access to the device B, and then it, it enters a random value for the pin, measure the power consumption of the device, and ask to the machine and learning algorithm what is the most likely value of the pin. Um, the second try will be this most likely value of the pin, if it's the correct value, it's okay, it's finished, the attack is, is finished. But if it's not, we have a second trace, which will be fed to the machine learning algorithm, and we will, will request what is the most likely value of the pin, and so on. And what we do, and the result is, on average, five tries only are necessary to guess the correct value of the pin. What we can say is, uh, the, this, this function is broken because uh, on Twizor you have 15 tries. So in all cases, uh, it, it, our, our technique allows us to uh, break the security of the pin. We, we are able to guess the correct value of the pin. Again, we responsibly disclose this uh, vulnerability and our attack to uh, Twizor. And it, in this case, they, they took this very seriously and they changed completely their implementation. Uh, their new implementation looks like something like this. I'm not, not completely sure. Um, what I can say, uh, I, I don't really like when it's complex because it's difficult to audit and to understand everything for the security, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's uh, more difficult to, to attack this implementation. So we are happy with this. Um, a second target was the scalar multiplication. The scalar multiplication is the core function for cryptography in cryptocurrency. It's used for signing, it's used for uh, computing your, your public key from your private key. So this is a very important function. Um, we looked at the implementation and we noticed this comment, it's secure against side channel attacks. So we decided to verify. So in a very similar way, we uh, input a large number of random uh, scalar. We collected traces and tried to figure out if there is a correlation between uh, the value of the bits, the successive bits uh, of the scalar and the traces. And as you can see, there is a very high correlation. So again, in a very similar way, we um, were able to retrieve the, the value of the scalar. And when you have the value of the scalar, uh, it's only mathematics to retrieve the, the private key. It's very easy. Uh, this attack uh, works with around uh, 10, 10 traces or something like this. Again, we responsibly disclosed this vulnerability to Twizzle on December. 
but this time they, they did not patch it. Um, there is a good reason why, because in order to trigger this function, the user needs to enter its pin. So if an attacker gets uh, physical access to your, your device, he won't be able to trigger this function and get the measurement in order to retrieve the key. So it's fair enough. But as their, their code is open source, the, their library could be used by other parties. So my requirement would be just to remove this comment because uh, it's simply for false. Usually, the pin verification function uh, is not attacked using side channel attack. Um, on on passport, on, on banking card, uh, in order to try to um, uh, break a pin verification, you don't use side channel attacks because uh, the, this kind of circuit, secure element, are very, very, very hard to attack against side channel attacks. And with a pin verification, only few traces are uh, definitely not enough. In order to uh, break uh, pin verification, the main vector is fault attacks. The idea is to inject a fault on the circuit during uh, its computation and bypass the pin verification. This is what uh, Sergei Volokitin presented uh, a few weeks ago at OffensiveCon. He was able to bypass the pin verification, pin verification function on a keep key and then uh, without uh, entering any pin uh, to be logged in uh, the, the keep key. He used EMFI. EMFI is electromagnetic fault injection and it worked uh, perfectly. There are other examples uh, in, the, in the past with, when people implemented fault attacks to break the security of Trezor. And the most recent one uh, was uh, Colin Offlin, which implemented also uh, EMFI to dump the seed from the device. And also another one from Dimitri Nadospazov, who, who implemented also a fault attack using glitches. And this fault attack allows him to, uh, uh, to dump the seed uh, from the device. In all these cases, the attacks can be fixed and has been fixed. Um, I think it's not completely fixed because uh, just the implementation is different. You will have to find another timing, another, uh, another part of the code to fault, and at the end, it will be uh, broken uh, again. What we did is a bit different. We worked on the same device and we found and implemented, implemented an attack which allows us to dump the seed for us also on the Trezor one and all the clones, this is the same, Trezor one, KeepKey, BWallet, all the clones. But also on Trezor T, I think we are the first one to do that. But unfortunately, in our case, there's no way to fix it. It's completely broken. So we decided not to explain how we did it because there is no way to fix it. So in order to keep the user safe, we decided not to explain how we did. But we explained that this very attack exists and this is very likely that and other people find it and exploit it. So we responsibly disclosed this vulnerability to Trezor in December, and they did not patch it, of course, because they simply can't, but they did not warn they, their user, and I think it's not a good practice. So in this condition, if ever you want to uh, use Trezor, you need to know that this very attack exists, and if you, know, if you want to um, prevent this attack, the only way to do it is to use a pretty long passphrase. When I say pretty long passphrase, is if you want to have the same level of security for, as the security of your seed, something like 256 bits, you need a 36 long character passphrase. But the problem with Trezor is that this passphrase must be input on the computer, and if your computer is malware, I think it's a problem. So to wrap up everything, we spent around two months to evaluate the security of the open source hardware wallet. 
What we found is that the supply chain attack vector is not taken into account seriously enough. We found that the software uh, stack is um, quite good uh, software stack. There was not so much uh, vulnerability and what we found uh, have been uh, fixed. We found um, a side channel attack which breaks the security of Trezor but uh, which has been patched by Trezor. We also find a um, side channel attack on the scalar multiplication um, of, uh, of Trezor which have not been patched but uh, again it does not break the secu security model. And we found two other attacks, one on Trezor 1 and one on Trezor T, which completely breaks the security of Trezor, and there is no way to uh, fix it. All these vulnerabilities have been disclosed uh, responsibly to Trezor between October and December. We had very good exchange with uh, their security team, and we agreed with them uh, for a disclosure date. We even agreed to two extensions and the, the disclosure date uh, uh, was a few days ago. And what we want first is to uh, keep all the users in the ecosystem safe, including uh, Trezor user. Uh, as a conclusion, I would want to say that uh, open source does not necessarily imply a security. And this work has been uh, performed not only by, by me, but by uh, all my team, the Ledger Donjon. Thank you for your attention. Uh, so we do have time for one quick question, if there is one. I guess this leads to the leading question as to what Ledger did differently. Um, what we did with, with, um, with Trezor during this, uh, this two months, uh, we, we do it every day uh, on, on our product. And the main difference, I would say, is that we uh, use uh, secure hardware for our implementation. I mean, um, our circuit is not used in boiler on, or on TV remote controller. It's a, it's a secure element. It's used in a secure application like a banking card, passport, and so on. And again, we spend a lot of time trying to uh, break into our device and, um, and so on. And for each of the attacks, we, uh, we, we try to find a, a countermeasure. So, so, I so I, you know, I understand how power supply and um, EMI attacks, you can design your code so that it you know, kind of always executes the same algorithm the same way every time, regardless if it's a successful entry or not. But supply chain attacks is a problem across the entire electronics industry. You're not alone with this problem. I have no idea how you're going to guarantee that you've got the right parts from ST or whoever the hell you're buying them from. Without, I, I, what do you do about that? OK, uh, pretty good question. Uh, uh, as I said, we use secure element. And in the secure element industry, there is common criteria. The common criteria is a third party evaluation process, uh, which leads to certification. During this evaluation process, um, the third party evaluation uh, verifies the security of, of, the, of the product. This is one thing. But it also verifies a lot of things, and including supply chain. I mean, during the supply chain, there, was, there is different uh, sites which are audited by a third party, and the site must comply a lot of different things. And when we receive uh, our circuit, uh, our circuit are uh, protected by uh, a private key that we, but only us uh, know. So we are the only one able to uh, load our firmware. And then when our firmware is loaded, we, there is no way uh, for us to, uh, uh, for others to uh, load firmware on it. And what we do when our firmware is loaded is to uh, pair one, our device with an HSM. That means our device generates a key pair, and the, the public key part is sent to our ledger HSM, which acts as a root of trust. Our ledger HSM signs this very uh, public key, and, uh, is, uh, and this public key, uh, signed public key, is uh, written inside the device. So when you receive your device, you connect it to your computer, 
there is a genuine check, and this genuine check consists for, for the device to prove to our HSM that his key has, uh, has been signed by our HSM. This is a, a cryptographic mechanism which allows us to prove that our device are genuine. It's simply impossible to uh, make a clone of our Trezor. Uh, 